Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. Money, money, money. That's what fuels the commercial real estate market. And the New York City and the regional market is really doing well. So what are these bankers who have all this money doing with it? So I've brought together these gentlemen to provide their insight on where they're lending, what they like, what they don't like, and how cautious they are in the real estate financing today. I guess they include Matt Galligan, who is the president of CIT Real Estate Finance. Joe Orfers, who's the head of commercial real estate lending for Investors Bank. Michael Weinstock, who's the group manager for M&T Bank. And last but not least, my friend Ben Stacks, who is the market manager for Greater New York Region for Capital One Bank. You know, I won't call you the plague, but you, you, you're, you're a guy, you know, you, nice you joined, no, nah, he's a friend, I could say this. You know, he joined, <laughs> uh, he came here to, to start up for this Irish bank, you know, Bank of Ireland just at the height of the recession. But you, and then you, when that happened, you went to CIT, but you've done a, a lot of good business. So how's CIT today, who when you joined them, really had a terrible portfolio, uh, what are they doing today and where do they want to put out money? Well, uh, in defense of the old era, CIT at that time was a finance company and they were very dependent upon high yield deals. And we all know in recession what happens to these high yield deals and there were B notes, equity, hotel transactions. Uh, what we did is we, we superimposed a bank model um, because CIT converted to a bank holding company uh, and when we did that we took all the bank standards of underwriting uh, as well as some of the standards of marketing to kind of cluster assets and make sure that we knew the marketplace and it's been very successful um, so uh, knock wood how much have you done over the last, what is it, about 18 months? It's 18, 18, 18, 18 months? months, exactly, and uh, a, a billion two fifty. And in what areas have you lent in? Well, uh, in, uh, by product type. Uh, by product type, we're in multifamily, office, uh, retail, and we've looked at industrial. We're going to close our first industrial deal uh, very shortly. Joe, when you joined investors, as we were saying before, they were a, a sleepy New Jersey bank at that time called Investor Savings, yes. changed over the, to, to Investors Bank. And they opened up a loan production office with you heading it in, over the market. Where do you, how much, what kind of business is investors doing today and what do they like doing today? Well, I mean, multifamily is surely our favorite uh, category, of course. We do about 80%, what I would say, multifamily, mixed use. Most of our stuff is actually in New York, even though we're a New Jersey-based bank. We did about a billion dollars out of our 42nd Street office last year, and you know, about a billion eight 
company-wide for 2012. So um, we're very active. Obviously, we have our roots in New Jersey, so we're, we're, uh, we have a lot of a big footprint there. But um, a lot of our things are really in the Connecticut, Long Island. Now, when you talk about Connecticut, my, uh, Michael, who's with M&T, you know, you handle Connecticut, Westchester. Rockland. Rockland. How, how is the market up there? Because it's a different market than what we're talking about, the New York City market. The New York City market, Ben has a, a, a larger area also. How do you see the market over there, and what is M&T looking at? Well, M&T is, is customer-centric. So we're not looking for any particular product type. We're looking for customers who, who we can follow and can follow us long term. So that just sets the baseline for which what we is, do. Which is interesting because aren't you similar uh, in many uh, aspects? Uh, um, yes, uh, we're, we're very similar. <laughs> and uh, and I, actually, I tip my hat to the folks at M&T, being a, an alumni, actually. Um, I think they've done a fantastic job managing their business. And um, I, you know, my hat's off to you guys. Uh, but you. we're, uh, you know, we feel the same way about the business. And uh, we are, you know, very customer centric. Uh, within that umbrella, we do a lot of different things for, for our customers. Um, and once we've identified sponsors that we like, uh, we can do a lot of different things for now, them. Now, CIT, you know, Ben is taking a region over here. Uh, Mike is taking a region. Joe's basically taking a region. You have, the, you have it on a national scale. But of, of the bill of the 1.2 so on that you put in, how much was from the metropolitan region? It's, it's a third. And then uh, we have some exposure in Boston, Washington, D.C., California, Texas, and some in the Midwest. We've taken kind of a contrarian view, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, multifamily in the Midwest. We're, we're in the Class B market there where we can get uh, assets at a 7.5% yield versus Class A assets in the Northeast at a 4 and a quarter yield. And we, we feel that that's a safer bet. What about you? Uh, I mean, the assets here in New York City, you know, we're talking about yield you know, five and a half caps or a five cap over here. Since you're not only in New York City, you know, you've gone to certain parts of New Jersey, and, and this really, I want to talk about the suburbs. A lot of developments in New Jersey have taken place because of the urban tax credit, uh, which uh, transit development oriented, TR transit development orientation, which has also happened in a lot of your markets, probably in the Stanford and Westchester That's area. That's correct. Uh, how important is the TOD to you in, in when you're looking at financing and transit oriented? I, I, I think it's important. I think the, the deals we've been, we've been looking at, um, some have that, some don't. Um, certainly when you've got to get and uh, build in a location that's hard to build in and you want to house um, um, all of the population, so so you need to get the rents right for that particular product line. Then then uh, then you need that support. Um, I think that uh, I, I think everybody's following transit-related type of uh, housing. Um, I think that if you look at certain markets, there's there's you know 98 percent uh, occupancy and some rentals in certain parts of Connecticut. So when you start focusing on markets. You can get a better feel for what's going to what's going to come and what really works. Mm. Today, they say when we're chasing yield, uh, sometimes you know because the multifamily rates, as you brought out, and as your colleague Scott has over there, the, the, the rates are really low. They're thin, even though the, the yields may be better than they were in 2007, 2008, because of the cost of funds. The, the interest rates are low, so certain people are saying, you know, I'll I'll go out and I'll do a construction loan you know, at 300, 400 over, I mean, but rates have gone down. How do you look at construction risks today? Because, you know, you can't build that apartment house in 12 months. It takes 18 to 24 months. How do you look at the construction world today? It, it, it's not a yield chase for us at all. I know you referenced that. Uh, for us to, to follow up, and I, I hope we don't belabor the point today, but uh, it's a sponsorship issue. And quite frankly, um, I, you know, I think the, the, the spreads that you're able to earn on construction loans these days are commensurate with the risk. And we're, uh, you know, again, it's, we're doing it because we're enhancing a relationship with a particular sponsor, not because maybe the market will give us a little bit more yield on something. Why do you go into the construction? I mean, that's, well, some banks who come into the New York City market, they come in to do the multifamily, they, you know, the, 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 the meat and potatoes, as they would say. 
Construction is not meat and potatoes. You have to have more people handling the operation. Sure. You need more supervision. You really need to watch the product because there are inherent risks over there. Yeah, I know I'm not a big construction fan. I know that we have a couple projects that we do, and we really do it the same way you guys do, with uh, really for the relationship. I mean, the yield to me is uh, is really not worth the risk. I mean, there's a lot of different things <laughs> you can lose on. You know, your leasing's not there, your for sale's not there, your construction runs over. Um, you know, anything can happen, and uh, I, don't, I don't think the, the, the risk is accurately rep represented in the yield uh, for what it is. I mean, if you go back just a couple of years to investors, uh, you know, uh, watch list, 95% of it was construction projects for sale or anything. In the city, I think it's a little, a little more buoyant, a little safer, but still, for the amount, of, as you say, Michael, for the amount of time and administration that you have to put into these projects, uh, you know, and it's a short-term yield, so you're talking about something over 18 months. You, you know, something that um, Matt brought out, he, it's, he's doing his first industrial coming up. Uh, New Jersey has been a big industrial state. Certain parts of Westchester have certain industrial type of things, you know, because if it's near the roads or the highways or, or the trains. How do you look at the industrial market today in general, all of you? Well, if you're in the right location in New Jersey, uh, it's quite attractive. And I, I think that uh, location is just one very important part one ultra important part of the industrial underwriting. You know, the buildings are not expensive to put up, and, you know, it, if you're in a uh, far removed from where you should be, then uh, you're going to run massive vacancies. Um, so I think, uh, to Ben's point earlier, you know, the, uh, on all these deals, whether it's construction or um, industrial development, industrial uh, lease product, I think it comes down to the sponsorship. And uh, there are a few key players that uh, we think highly of. The other thing for a bank is uh, some of these buildings uh, just don't cost a lot to put up. So um, it, it's hard to get the critical mass to make it attractive. We're doing our deal in a pooled uh, transaction uh, in part with office uh, added in. And it's well leased. I mean, as, as far as construction goes, I think there's some very good urban infill projects going on right now. You see Target, you see Marshalls in areas you've never seen them before. And so, um, you know, like we've, like we've talked about, the sponsorship is everything because it takes a lot of the construction risk out from the bank. On the, on the bank side, uh, banks who do construction can take a lot of risk out for the customer as well. Um, what happens, you know, I, I was bringing this up before in, in the green room about, you know, as, as we always have, it, it happened in the early 2000s, we had the German lenders, we had the Irish lenders coming in. Now we have certain out-of-state lenders or new banks coming in, you know, you know SunTrust that we, we know, uh, Union Bank now took over the PB Capital Portfolio, uh, BBVA coming in here, uh, U.S. Bank over here. We so, have, we have, we have uh, insurance companies uh, bidding on construction deals. Yeah. That's right, so yep. you, have the, you have these, additional competitors and as I think Matt was utilized I, in one of my articles recently you know you have quotas or I hate to say you know you you have not quotas you want to reach a certain goal <coughs> during the year that that you've told management the management has asked you to to say how do you handle how you, what you, if, you, you can win um, and and, uh, and, and uh, gain acceptance from the market by doing a, a very good job at what you do so if you're a very good construction lender and you understand all aspects of it and the nuances of it, you limit some of the risk for the borrower. And, you know, there's a price for that. However, there's, there's, uh, there, there's uh, the, the quality of it. I mean, the construction market's changing. You're going to modular units. Those modular units don't get permits on site. They get permits coming from the factory. So you have to adjust to those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And you have to adjust your commercial, your, your your construction lending requirements. What about specialty lending today? You know, we brought up industrial, but you know, we were talking about hospitality has done exceptionally well in New York City and within the region uh, nearby. Okay, you know, you went into a construction loan in Newark. There hadn't been a new hotel in 40 years, so you know, there's a, the op there was an opportunity. Plus, there was a lot of equity. How do you look at specialties such as hospitality? data centers, um, you know, uh, 
these huge health clubs which we spoke about a number of years ago. How do you look at those type of things? Because I know there's a big job out near you with one of these lifetime fitness facilities uh, and so on. There is, and, and, uh, and they're, they're going up, um, and there's a market for them. Um, as far as the specialty aspect of it, like, like when, when we assess, when we look at who the borrower is, and I, and, and I know I'm belaboring the point, and I, and, and it, it's but a it all, theme. It, and right, a common theme, but it all comes back to that. So if we're looking at hospitality and, and uh, a hotel going up, we certainly are looking at the marketplace, mm -hmm. but that sponsor needs to be able to carry that, right? So our biggest risk is I'm not, you know, with a good, good developer, we're not worried about getting through construction. We're worried about getting the stabilization. But, but he, here's, the, here's the situation <clears throat> right here, okay? We, we all know we want to have you know, it's, you know, it's relationship. People say, what are the key things in real estate? Location, location, location. Relationship. Okay. In banking, in what we're talking about, is saying relationship, relationship, relationship. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the multifamily market that you are in, that, you're, that your colleagues are in, and some of the, the deals you're in, it's a commodity product that there's a lot of people out there. And these relationships, unfortunately, do not care about the same relationships it, that you have. And it's not just multifamily either. Keep in mind that at the, um, on, you know, the stabilized commercial assets as well, that has become somewhat commoditized oh, as yeah. well. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's another thing that's driving that end of the market. True, but you know, each thing is different. You know, even uh, there's 20 unit multifamily or 50 unit multifamily, they're all just ever so slightly different. And, and uh, you know, maybe they have a 421A, they're burning off, and who's gonna, they might look at it differently than we look at it. There's a lot of ways to, to look at the same project within the, and so it's, it is a commodity on one side, but it's not always as cut and dry as that. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it was recently stabilized. They just converted five stabilized units to market. You know, some people are gonna look uh, at that you, differently. How do you look at a, like a failed condo, uh, which was a failed condo before today, are you, are you, you know, are you, will you do that type Well, we of will. We'll look at it. I mean, I think we, we, we underwrite it slightly differently. I mean, we're looking at, um, you know, obviously taxes, I think, are a big thing and how they're being assessed and, you know, is there an abatement that's going to burn off? I and mean, those are the type of things you, you see. But, again, we go back to sponsorship, just like, uh, like these guys. And, and, what, uh, what about, you know, marketplaces? You know, when we talk about Westchester, you know, there are certain cities which are good, and when we talk about Hudson County, there are other cities. I mean, and I know that your senior management, if I said to them, you want to do an office building in Newark, they'd say to me, no. If I said it to your senior management, even unless it's the best, best sponsorship. Well, let's okay? qualify that. Th th okay, if it's the finest sponsorship who's going to sign on the, on the bottom line, maybe, okay? But you don't, you're not running into certain neighborhoods in Yonkers, okay? Um, you know, because it's a different market. I, look, I think we look all over the, I mean, from my perspective, we look all over the tri-state region. Um, in fact, we do follow our sponsors outside of New York as well um, to other, other um, you know, states around, around the United States. But again, not to, you know, go, go uh, too much on this point, but um, we're re really looking at who stands behind the deal, their capacity for, you know, handling projects or, or loans that, you know, may have you know vacancy issues or other kind of challenges and their ability to get through that so it's not as much about saying you know i'm not comfortable in a particular area it's saying i i'm looking at the bro the whole the whole economy here what? Michael, i have to throw my support to yonkers because <laughs> we, we yeah, consider we, that we a good market as well. okay um, I, and i i you know i only brought up because there's this it's a perception if you look at downtown yonkers um um, and, and I was on a panel recently, and we discussed this. And 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 uh, Arthur Collins, who built some of the first ones there, who I had on a on a Yonkers panel. Yeah, and and who you would have to ha have to suggest that's visionary when when you go in there, um, but it's not anymore. Um, we have 200 plus units um, in our portfolio there. We did them from construction to now. Uh, there's more on the come. They've created a, 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 a center that's but Yonkers 10 25 years ago minutes. was not the Yonkers. Of Visionary. The, but uh, Visionary. Uh, downtown Yonkers is really quite impressive. We financed a, a Class B office building uh, in the newly uh, new development area. And uh, we're, we're getting, we just were taken out on Friday uh, by a conduit loan. But um, it, it's really impressive what the city has done there and how they've supported the tenancy. If you're doing business with the city and you're a tenant in the, you, you need to be a tenant in one of these buildings. And 
it's a nice place to live. Yeah. Now, I, I grant you that it's a very confined area. Yeah, correct. You know, you bring out a very interesting point. For a couple of years, we didn't have the CMBS market. They had left the world. Now they have returned. And when the CMBS market, they don't care about sponsorship. They don't care about the asset in many cases. They don't even see the asset. They don't go down there. They, you know, they, they trust some appraiser or in many cases, they don't even care about the appraiser. What happens when, and you came out of that world, what happens when the CMBS market is out there and they're competing with you guys? You know, I'm not even that worried about that, and I'll tell you why, and I'm sure these guys do the same thing. I mean, we have a lot more flexibility than they do, even in their, their rigid standards. I mean, we have relationship lending, so that means we can sit across from a guy and listen to his business plan and structure something exactly correctly. We're not trying to sell it next time. I, I was just bringing so, it up. I wasn't. No, no, I'm saying is I think it's, it's not something I'm concerned about, really, because it's, uh, you know, when you're in relationship lending. What, what about this? I, I am concerned about it. Uh, we, we've done some Class B plays, and we did that because we thought that they were safer, as I said, uh, in the multifamily sector. And we're getting taken out of those deals where they would have gone to Fannie or Freddie, but uh, the sponsors are concerned about rates going up, and they're seeing the CMBS rates as being pretty attractive right now. And they're locking in for periods of 10 years. Yeah, that's true. That's something you know, that people, certainly is something. You know, 10 year money is. But uh, you know, really I, I, I think my, I think Michael brought it up before. You have insurance companies who aren't lending on construction. But you know what this does? Things. This shrinks the bank to the space that they're normally in, which. Uh, you know, short end construction, loans. short end construction loans, or you know, taking market risk. Right. What about location risk? You know, in areas that are areas in transition, and like we said, Yonkers ten years ago was a different market. Newark ten years ago was even worse than it is today. Okay. Um, Jersey City twenty years ago, no one would mm. invest in Jersey City. Where are the opportunities? Because lenders have to look at different op different markets, where, where are you going to and where are your borrowers going to? Are they going to uh, Bushwick? Are they going out further in uh, different counties? You know, you know, where, do, where, do, where do they see the opportunities today? Well, I mean, on the small, we do mostly, our average loan size is probably is under $3 million. So we're, we're, we play more in the kind of uh, mid-range in Brooklyn. I think a lot of the opportunities we're seeing are, are, are heading towards east. I don't know if there are too far into Bushwick just yet, but I think that there's a lot of uh, infill. What about the Bronx? No, not so much. I mean, I think that's a stabilized housing product, which is very attractive, and, and I don't see any real uh, gentrification there anytime soon. But um, we, We've seen some of our sponsors uh, move away from Manhattan naturally, I think. Because of the cost of land. Just the cost areas. of land, and it's, and, it's run up, and it's come up so quickly. Um, but uh, we've, we've certainly done some deals in the Bronx, you know, kind of some urban redevelopment plays. Uh, we've seen a bunch of our New York developers go over into um, Brooklyn and Queens, Jersey City as well. So, I mean, there's, you know, people are fanning out a little bit into, you know, right. into some of those areas. Yeah, the Bronx is redoing some of its, of its housing stock and, uh, and the retail follows. You know, a couple of years ago, um, banks were taking large, large pieces of deals. I know you guys were small and you've gone into certain very large deals. What's happening? to the clubs or the syndications. Are, are, are you syndicating a lot of your loans today? We buy a lot in that market. We, we buy a lot in that market. We partner, we try to partner with the same uh, banks over and over. I think it's a great way to put money out quickly. As an ongoing trend or as a, a more recent trend, I would say, um, uh, a lot of uh, banks have started to um, underwrite uh, much larger loans and, uh, and take syndication risk, whereas you know, even a year ago, uh, they were less likely to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think you're going to see in the in the so, near so future. So some, we're seeing less uh, because I remember as like 157 and other mm -hmm. deals, deals weren't closed until they knew that they had the the team in place That's for right. the club. Today, you're seeing less of that. Would less you? of I mean, yeah. and I think that the you know the sizes yeah. of underwrites from institutions are getting larger as well as they get confident about the distribution well, they're after. Uh, I don't know whether it was fully underwritten, but the general growth deal that was just done was a billion and a half dollar transaction, which they sold out. Well, I, I, I tell you, most of the deals, 250 million and below, are fully underwritten deals at this time. We've transitioned into that, and it's becoming more of an expectation. Um, it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad uh, uh, place from a customer relationship point, ship standpoint to play, though. 
because controlling the deal and bringing them what, what's best about your institution and then bringing in partners who, who are good partners, who understand how we work and we understand how they work, those are the, in essence, club deals. They could be larger than that, but, but, uh, but having Here, a good here's partnership Here's an interesting in thing. As I said, I was with Mike Sarkozy of J.P. Morgan last week, and he was saying, you know, we're doing deals at 85%. He says, but we're not doing 85%. We're doing 70%, and then we have this enormous pool of people who want to give us MES money to give us that additional leverage. How do you, as banks, okay, as opposed to, uh, you know, the mortgage-backed security world, look at allowing people to have that additional leverage by finding preferred equity or mezzanine money? That, that's, uh, that's still leverage. And to I le consider it leverage. It's okay. still leverage, and to lever up a property to where where the metrics are, uh, uh, are, are thin is, is critical to how you're going to rate your loan at the end of the day. And it's, and it's going to impact you as a bank if, if you're levering up, whether it's your money or it's somebody else's money. Right. Right. Exactly. And Same thing. And, um, you know, I think that, um, I think that uh, we, we also draw a distinction, too, between construction loans and stabilized loans. Right. So on construction, it's much harder for us to get comfortable with that kind of structure. I mean, because, you know, when I'm sitting with Mike and he says, you know, look, we're, we're taking only 65%, but we have this enormous pool of people doing MES financing from 6 to 14%. You know, needless to say, there's the risk-reward. How do you look at uh, allowing somebody to put additional debt, which is what Mike said? Well, we don't want it on construction loans. No, but in, in general. Yeah, we have done deals with it, you know, and uh, we, we think, First of all, we want that player to be a non-financial player so that if they had to foreclose us out, they would understand how to operate the property. You know, it's interesting. When I was at J.P. Morgan, I was with the person, and Mike was explaining to my borrower, who happens to be in the hotel business, he says, there are different type of people that you want, you know, Starwood really wants to take, certain people want to take over the property. Uh, a mez lender who wants to take over the property, you don't want because they want you to default. A mess lender who just wants to get paid their risk, it's a different case. So I think that's... Loan to own. It's a loan to own, no question. Speaking of that, are you seeing competition from the Starwoods, the North Star, uh, and these other finance companies? I mean... They're, they're all over the place. And as your uh, friend at J.P. Morgan said, uh, they're just... <laughs> it's like Alphabet City in terms of the number of uh, players that you could go to for mezzanine money. It's all over the place. And I understand why the uh, the yields in that market are very attractive, and but but it's risk reward. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know my, my colleagues in crime, it, they they love this type of reward, and you know maybe I'm too old to take this type of risk. You know, it's a question of what type of return that you want. But but I think it it, it basically says that you know, as we are in the you know spring of 2013, there are a lot of players out there. One thing that I'm hearing specifically from all of you is its relationship. It's customer oriented. Even though the world is getting, you know, better, the, the way you want to lend to is relationship with a good customer. Uh, and there's deals out there, and you know, it'll be financed for the right people. And I'd like to thank Matt Galligan, Joe Orifice, Michael Weinstock, and Ben Stacks, and I'll see you next week.